Hi, Reverend Stu here, uh, another video bit. Today we're going to continue our series during Holy Week uh, towards the Easter Sunday and the story of Christ's resurrection. And we're going to take another painting today and have a look at that and see what it has to tell us or what it can encourage us to reflect upon in the story and also for ourselves in our own lives. Artists use a certain set of language in the same way that poets and economists and politicians have a set vocabulary that they use to communicate something about the human experience. And many artists have returned to the experience of the disciples, of the person Jesus Christ, to try and describe what that was just as people of faith today bear witness using a different set of words sometimes, a different vocabulary, but the vocabulary of faith and belief to try and share what it is that they're experiencing when they encounter that life force, that being that they describe as Jesus Christ, the person who they have encountered through the stories passed on by the disciples and they continue to encounter today in their lives. And I hope that you will in some way encounter that same presence as we look at the painting today. The painting we're looking at today is titled Mary Anoints Christ's Feet. It was painted in 1907 by the artist Niels Stevens. And I'll give you a moment just to uh, familiarise yourself with it. I wonder what strikes you first of all. Niels has taken this painting from one of the accounts in the Gospel of John uh, after Jesus has come into Jerusalem. And I'm just going to read the uh, passage it's based upon uh, while I give you a chance to look at the painting again. Chapter 12 in the Gospel of John. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointing Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for three hundred denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. Jesus said, Leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. Let's just take a little tour through the painting uh, before we look at it in the context of the biblical story. Um, and I think we'll see that the vocabulary and the style of Niels and the story come together and provide us with plenty of things to reflect upon today. The framing of this painting is very powerful and there's lots of movement in it and our eye is meant to travel I believe from the bottom right hand corner where we see a figure I'm presuming it's meant to be Judas leaning right out of the frame and then we follow the line around the figures at the table round to the bottom left hand corner where we notice of course that there is the figure of Mary but she's not even included in the frame. The central part of the painting is actually the table, which has been vacated and is empty. The disciples and Jesus are at the far end of the table, and that perspective makes us present at the head of the table. I think there is something also in the two arches behind Jesus which might also, as well as Mary's anointing, speak of 
tombs and burial and notice that one of them is left empty. I'm wondering if we come back to the figures in the painting, I'm wondering if, if we start again on the bottom right, the third person in, who is definitely the palest person there, might be Lazarus. I'm presuming he would still be quite pale after his experience. But as we travel around the painting from Judas, who is leaning out, as if getting up in indignation or impatience, right the way around to Jesus, who leads us out of the painting via Mary. So let me put the story in a bit of context, if I may. And I can only describe this situation with uh, Judas and the disciples' shock here as almost becoming farcical. As Jesus made it clear that he was heading towards Jerusalem, the disciples seem to have become obsessed with finding out who's going to be in charge. Because in their understanding, once they get to Jerusalem, the kingdom of God, that earthly rule of Jesus, is going to begin. And they've been jostling for position to see who's going to be in charge. Peter's made his declaration that I'm your man, I'll follow you to death. And two of the disciples got their mum to come and ask Jesus and say, can we have the two top jobs, please, when you come into your kingdom? But against this, Jesus has been constantly reminding them that they're not counting the cost, that they're missing the point. They're not looking at the right things. They're either looking at money, whether that's the thing that you need to get into the kingdom, or that they're saying these things, but they don't know. They really genuinely don't know what he's going to have to go through before the kingdom comes. They haven't counted the cost. And yet here, at this point in the story, for once, the disciples are counting the cost and they jump up. Judas jumps up. Look how much this perfume would cost. But of course it's the wrong moment to count the cost and it's the wrong kind of cost that they're talking about. And here I think the artist helps us to see and think about some of these things. Notice again how Jesus is almost on the edge of the painting. And indeed throughout his ministry, Jesus was figuratively and literally always trying to draw people outside of their usual frame of reference always pointing out to those who were not included. And notice at this point again how Mary hasn't even got a body in the painting. She is only partially there. She makes a brief appearance here. But Jesus is directing all their attention to her outside of the painting itself. Mary, of course, has counted the cost. She has realised that you cannot buy God's love, that we do not come to God because we are worthy or great. We do not expect God to take notice of us because of our achievements, because of our piety, because of our righteousness. Instead, like Mary, we find that God notices us. It is that gesture that Jesus makes to Mary that she has already experienced. And it is that response to God's love offered to us freely that brings her to her knees. And indeed, I think there is a response here from Jesus to the disciples. If you would be greatest, do as Mary does. Come and worship. Of course, Mary is, in a sense, prefiguring Christ's death. He won't get that kindness and tenderness at the hands of the Romans or the Pharisees. And so she is giving it to him now as a source of comfort for the difficult times to come. And I wonder if there's something there for us today. Notice again the empty table and the invitation every day, every moment of every day is for each of us to come and take that seat at the table with Jesus, to be with him, to eat with him, 
to engage in those parts of being a human being, to eat and touch and see and be very present with him as he is present in and with us, in our humanity. But I wonder also if we can take something from the gesture that Jesus made to the disciples. I think he's almost saying to them, those of you who would be great in the kingdom of heaven, you better join the queue. And the queue starts behind Mary, behind those who worship and who praise him and love him. But it's not a queue of hierarchy. The gesture is, Mary has learnt that God's love is given to us freely, not because of who we are. In fact, very often, always, I would say, <laughs> in spite of who we are and what we've done that should exclude us, God's love is offered to us freely, generously, graciously, faithfully. It is for us to decide whether we will receive it. And when we take that step to say, yes, I will receive it, I will step into that love, then we will find gratitude and worship growing in our hearts. Mary had indeed counted the cost and had realised somehow that here was God that she could touch and she could worship and that God had offered her the love that she so desperately needed but could never seem to earn or find herself. I pray we may find that same love in the person of Jesus today. I'm going to close by reading the collect, the prayer for this week. God of all redeeming grace, in your great love you gave your only Son to die for the sins of the whole world. Help us by your Holy Spirit to worship you with reverence and to enter with joy into the celebration of those mighty acts whereby you bring us life and immortality through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thanks very much for listening and for watching. I hope you found something useful. I'll be back again tomorrow with another painting and another reflection on the journey through Holy Week. Till then, may God bless you and all those you love. In Jesus' name. Amen.